Good evening. Welcome to Tales from the Crypt. Or as I like to call it, Production Design Special Effects. Remote Online Learning Access Channel. We're going to have some interesting times ahead of us in the next six weeks. But please bear with me and I will bear, bear with you uh, through the various technical challenges we're get, no doubt going to run into. But it could be entertaining. It'll certainly be informative. And we're all going to learn from it. And with that, with no further ado, let us begin. Really? We're going to start like that? Okay. Welcome back to the class where I can't spell the word effect. We got up to week eight. This is now week 10, breaking glass. So first of all, we're going to talk about breakaway glass and breakaway props. We're not going to talk very long about them because I think that's more of a prop issue than a special effect issue. This, for example, is a real bottle. Most important thing about breakaway props is make sure they are breakaway props before you break a plate over somebody's head and find out it's your grandmother's finest china and you cut them. Uh, same goes, goes for breakaway bottles and breakaway glass. Uh, there's a number of different ways you can do this. You can buy the props. There are some resources in Canvas for that. Um, they're not that expensive. You can make your own. You can do it the old fashioned way with uh, using sugar glass, which is not very satisfactory. If you're going to go to all the trouble to build a mold of, say, this glass, this bottle, if you're going to go to the trouble to make a silicone mold, don't put 35 cents worth of sugar inside of it because it won't look very good. And in areas of high humidity, they will always remain sticky and flies will like them. Um, and they, 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 don't, they don't look very good. Uh, you can buy these, as I say, glasses, wine bottles, plates, pretty much anything you can imagine breaking on somebody or crushing in your hands. Uh, you can buy them from a variety of places, mostly out in L.A. Alfonso's is probably the most well-known. Um, and then you can use um, smash plastic, which is, you do the same thing, you make a mold out of silicone, um, but you fill it, you rotationally mold it, pour it out, do it again, pour it out. Um, what's called smash plastic, it, it, it dries kind of hard. Um, it looks pretty good when you rub some alcohol on it, it gives it a nice gloss. And then you can pop somebody on the head. Another thing to say about that is, Really, you should use a stuntman. If you're going to break something over somebody's head, you want to be sure they don't turn at the last minute and look at you and you clock them in the eye with what hopefully is a breakaway bottle, but still will have shards in it. Um, the stuff is hard, but not normally hard enough to hurt you. But if you hit somebody in the face, it is going to hurt. Um, it's pretty easy to do, making it yourself, but we're not going to go into that again. That's models, um, props, casting. Um, not, well, not what I would call a special effect. Um, what else? Oh, you can, you can um, make your own foam baseball bats with plastic barbed wire around them if you want to do some nice horror zombie kind of stuff. You can buy or rent um, felling axes, machetes, cleavers, all kinds of fake or foam um, knives, bludgeoning in instruments, chainsaws. Nick, you could probably rent one from Nick. Um, maybe. Yeah, oh, and if you were making, making furniture, it's another thing you can do. You can, you can again buy kits of furniture which are made out of balsa wood. You assemble them yourself, and when you sit on them, they collapse. And hopefully they don't stab you. Again, ideally you use a stuntman. Because anything where people are falling onto what potentially could be sharp, jagged objects, like the leg of a chair, you, a stuntman will have the right kind of under protective gear, ballistic vests, um, back protectors, all kinds of stuff. They'll, they'll might wear a hat, and underneath the hat will be a special cap which has got um, shock-absorbing plastic in it. So you can boff them on the head, and it won't hurt them. Uh, stuntmen are obviously expensive, but that is a caution. Be very careful. And if you do make these yourself, make sure you make them exactly, and I mean exactly the right way. 
You don't want them to have a big lump of glob in the bottom and you clock somebody with it and that's what hits them. It's got to be as thin as you can make it and evenly thin. Um, and again, it's probably better to buy these. Um, that way, somebody else's liability. But they're, they're much better at making them, honestly, and they're not that expensive. You probably find that it costs you the same amount of money to rent them as to make them yourself. Anyway, uh, if you're making breakaway furniture, let's say it's a table like this one and somebody needs to fall on it and it needs to break through, um, you basically build them out of balsa wood. Again, that's a props construction set kind of thing. So we're not going to go into that. What we are going to talk about is breaking glass, specifically panes of glass. So what do we know about glass? It's basically sand with a few other things thrown into it. Um, and it comes basically in three flavors. There's plain old window glass, which is, as you can imagine, what's in a window or um, a picture frame, um, plain glass. You break it, it breaks, it shatters into jagged, nasty, sharp, gonna cut you, whatever you do. If you fall through a glass window, you're in real trouble in a, in a plain glass window. Um, back when cars used to have windscreens made out of plain old glass, when you went through the windscreen, because they also didn't have seat belts, um, it was pretty much a death sentence. If you, you cut your throat, you got cut to shreds. When you landed on the glass on the hood of your car, very bad things happened to you. We got, so we got to safety glass. Safety glass comes in two flavors. So first of all, laminated glass. Laminated glass is two pieces of glass sandwiched around a piece of plastic. A piece of very strong, I don't know what it is exactly, it's flexible and it's glued either side of that piece of plastic. So when you hit it, the glass doesn't come away. It stays stuck to the plastic and to the other side. There's a video um, in Canvas um, showing, um, I think it's Pilkington or somebody, do, demonstrating their safety glass with a baseball bat and the difference between regular glass and laminated glass. It's also the kind of glass you would see in a, um, in a gas station in Chicago. Bulletproof glass. Um, Humvees would have bulletproof glass. They might have several layers of plastic sandwiched with several layers of glass. Um, and again, when you hit it, when you break it, it doesn't fall away. Um, it does remain very sharp, but you can't get through it. It's more often used more as a burglar deterrent or a, um, a threat reduction um, aspect. Notably, uh, car windscreens are made out of laminated glass. Um, they used to be made out may be made out of toughened glass, but they, they've changed that to laminated glass. And how can you tell when a piece of glass is laminated? What you would do is you would look at the edge of it. And if you look very carefully, you'll be able to see, be able to see the sandwich. There'll be a little bit of something going on in the middle. On an old car that's been, maybe it came from the south where there's a lot of sun, you can often see bubbles around the edge where it's starting to delaminate, which is clearly not a good thing, still effective. Um, but we don't want to use laminated glass because when you run into it, you say stay stuck. The glass stays stuck and you bounce off. Um, I don't think there's really any use except for safety purposes off camera. Um, you might put a piece of laminated glass in front of the camera if you wanted, um, if you were concerned about shrapnel or something in a very dramatic situation uh, coming at the camera. Or you want to, maybe the camera crew are hiding behind and they need to see what's going on. Which brings us to the third kind of plastic, the kind of plastic, listen to me, the third kind of glass, tempered glass. Now tempered glass is a very interesting very interesting um, thing because it's exactly the same as window glass, it's, but it's been heat treated. It's not special glass at all. Any glass pretty much can be made into tempered glass. Um, the only restrictions are that if you want, if I want, for example, wanted to drill a hole in this glass, I could do, well, no, not in this glass, because this is tempered glass. If this were a regular piece of glass, window glass, I could drill a hole in it very carefully with a diamond bit and lots of water. Well, maybe show that in a later video. Um, let's say I wanted to bolt it to something or I wanted to stick a microphone or a camera lens through it. I could do that. Once this glass has been toughened or tempered, you can do nothing to it. You can't sand it. You can't bevel the edges. You can't notch it. You can't do anything. If you do, fun things will happen. 
it will explosively break. You've all seen the, uh, I'm sure you've all seen this happen, done in many instances in many movies where when the, when the glass breaks, the whole thing goes whoop at one go and goes from being a clear piece of glass into a hundred thousand tiny little chunks and then falls to the ground. That's what will happen if you try and sand this or put any kind of power tool on it or even scratch it. If you scratch this with a piece of carbide, it's going to explode. Um, just the way it is. Uh, so there's a video in on canvas that describes how um, tempered glass is made or is transformed from regular glass into tempered glass. It might be quite informative. Um, it's actually not that difficult to do if you have the right equipment. Um, this was very, this piece of glass here was very um, nicely donated by Chicago Tempered Glass. Um, they're on just off California, I think. Look them up on the internet. They're very nice people. And you could get a, a let's say a shower door sized piece of glass tempered by them for a very reasonable cost, maybe a hundred bucks, something like that. Um, don't quote me on that. Uh, but it's, it's quite reasonable. So if you have some funky thing that you need to make, you have, have it made, then you have it tempered. Um, and then it will break in the way you want it to break. So um, how is it made? A very quick description, because it's kind of interesting. Uh, you take a piece of glass, let's say this is window glass, you heat it up to a very hot temperature, I don't know what that is, and then very, very, very quickly you quench it, which means you, I think by blowing air on it, you cool the outside down very quickly while the middle is still extremely hot. And what happens is the outsides, both sides, crystallize or recrystallize very, very quickly and they become rigid. The inside is still very hot. Um, and then what happens is the inside, like a soft scented candy, the inside is still soft. Um, as it hardens, it contracts, but it can't contract properly because the outside is already rigid. So it's kind of like the inside becomes smaller than the outside will allow it to be. Um, and this puts tremendous tensile and compressive strength, uh, strength forces into the glass itself. It's kind of like the TARDIS from Doctor Who in reverse. It's actually smaller on the inside than it is on the outside. Um, so think of this as a very energetic piece of glass that is waiting for an opportunity to go bang, um, which is what we are going to do to it. So you are following along so far. So how can we tell the piece of glass we have is actually made out of tempered glass? Because if you run as a stuntman, again, there's some videos of this, stuntmen trying to run into pieces of glass. Well, they're actually rugby players or soccer players or no, American football players, pardon my confusion, trying to run into plates of glass for the Guinness Book of World Records and failing and bouncing off. In one of them, which I didn't put on canvas, uh, the guy does it wearing a World War II German helmet, runs headlong into a piece of glass. There's a whole bunch of them lined up that he's going to allegedly go through one after the other. The first piece of glass, he bounces off it and breaks his neck. He is okay. I mean, as okay as he was beforehand, which was clearly not okay. Um, it's clearly a nut job. Um, but so if your stuntman is going to run through a window, um, he's going to, maybe it's a bar scene, something, somebody throws him through a window. If you don't break the window before the stuntman gets there, toughened glass, tempered glass is incredibly strong. I mean, watch this. Of course, I'm going to assume it's going to break. I don't like doing that. Uh, if I was going to do that for real, I would put on headphones, uh, ear defenders, and a face shield and gloves because I'm not completely certain this is tempered glass. Well, I am because I bought it from Chicago Tempered Glass, or rather, they gave it to me as a it was a test piece. As a result, it does not have the telltale tag in the corner that every piece of tempered glass by law has to have. If you look at your, the side windows of your car, in the bottom corner it will say toughened or tempered or something to that effect etched into the glass before they temper it because if you etch it in afterwards, kablooey. Okay, so we've got a piece of glass. It's, it's, maybe it does have the tag on it, the etching glass, etched glass tag on it. Maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, there is another, another way to tell. You can take... Uh, let me let me go and find some sunglasses. Okay, so now we're going to look at a 
cheap and cheerful way to tell whether temp tempered glass is in fact tempered or if, whether it's just plain old window glass. <clears throat> what you're going to need is a phone with a nice white screen and a pair of polarized sunglasses. You can also use something like this. This is a polarizing lens from a camera, from a DSLR. And if you look at look through the glass, let me see how close we can focus in on this. Probably not very close. Um, if we look through the glass at the phone and then put the polarizing filter in front, you can see there are lines of, this is not very well focused, is it? There are lines of stress. You see those lines that aren't there? Now they are. Coming away from the corners, like kind of bluish. Um, you can also do it with, as I say, a pair of polarized sunglasses. Again, you can see we can you can see the lights in my ceiling apart from anything else, which is not very helpful. Um, there we go. That's that's even more ceiling. But you can see those lines. These are stress lines um, because when the glass is trying to contract in on itself, um, all the stress happens in the corners. So if you can see these lines, there's a very good chance that your glass is in fact tempered. Uh, you can also do this with a pair of sunglasses. Put the sunglasses on. When you're driving down the road, look at the back windows of the cars in front of you with polarized sunglasses on and do this. Like you're a dog being given a strange instruction. And you will see the tempering on the rear window of the glass change and you'll see its stress patterns. But, I ask you, say, how do I know if my sunglasses are polarized? Well, there are two ways of doing that. First, as I said, put them on, go outside and look at the back window of a pretty much any car and tilt your head like a dog. If you see things changing or reflections disappearing, you have polarized sunglasses. Alternatively, get another pair of sun pol bleh, polarized sunglasses. You can see me? Oh, you can see out my nose. That's wonderful. Get another pair of sunglasses and put the two together and rotate them. If both of them are polarized, the uh, amount of light transmission will go from just tinted to pretty much black. I'll demonstrate that in a very awkward way with two pairs of sunglasses right now. So that's the first pair of sunglasses on. You can see it's dim, but not too bad. This is the second pair of sunglasses. If I put them on there now, it's dim and out of focus. But if I rotate them, you can see it gets darker. And it gets to the point where the lines of polarization line up and almost completely block out the light coming through. So that's how you tell you have polarized sunglasses. And also how to look up my nose. So we've established one, you have polarized sunglasses, I hope. And if not, get yourself some, they're very useful. Reduce glare, you can see through water at high noon. Um, sorry, uh, distraction. Um, Two, that you actually have a piece of tempered glass. So now a stuntman is going to run at your piece of tempered glass and run through it, which means you have to break it just milliseconds before he hits it. Otherwise, he's going to be having a long talk with you and you don't want to have a long talk with stuntmen with broken noses. So how are we going to break it? The official, correct and expensive way of doing it is to use a glass popper, which is a small chunk of steel that is drilled and milled and contains a small squib or debt which when electronically triggered it's often by using uh, an electric eye or somebody just standing there with a button um, the squib explodes it's a bit like a gun um, inside the chamber um, where the squib is there is what's known as a hilti nail hilti is a brand name of uh, masonry nail i think i have one here through the magic of cameras, here it is. Um, you can see it's really just uh, a masonry nail, um, that, which means it's very, very hard, hardened, hard and hard end, um, designed to be fired explosively into concrete. So if you see, ever see anybody um, with what looks like kind of a shotgun, holding it down to the ground and pulling the trigger and there's a loud bang, they're firing Hilti nails or Ramset, is another brand name, Ramset nails into concrete. So they're very tough. Um, anyway, this nail is where the barrel would be on a pistol. So it is forced at a very high speed 
out of this ch little chunk of metal, which is the gun effectively, into the glass. Um, and because it's got a head on it, it can't fly out like it's actually a bullet. It stays stuck inside the gun, as it were. Then you dismantle it, pull the bullet out, the bullet, the ram set nail, the hilti nail out, put a new squib in, put the new button, the new bullet. I keep calling these bullets. Put the new nail in and you can pop another piece of glass. Um, these things are, you can rent them, but you need somebody who is licensed by the ATF to handle debts or squibs or loads. Um, and that costs real money, probably cost you $1,000 a day. Plus every time they pop the trigger, it's probably gonna cost you another 25 bucks um, since they have to buy the squibs. Um, but that's the, way, the real way to do it. Um, and when you do this, normally you do it twice. You have one of these in each corner of the piece of glass. So you would put, if this is our, somewhere I've got a stuntman. Where is the stuntman? Bingo, stuntman. So as the stuntman approaches the window or is being thrown towards, or maybe he's on a kicker plate and he's being hurled um, from an explosion or something towards the glass, which has not yet broken, as he approaches just before he breaks his fingers by hitting it, in each corner, or two corners at least, you pick them wherever's out of camera, there will be a glass popper. The glass poppers will blow, and within a fraction of a second, the fracture lines will, sh will go across the glass and he will be able to just push his way through it. The glass will actually generally fall, but if you do the timing right, the glass will break just as he hits it. If you do it just wrong, he hits the glass, breaks his face, then the glass breaks. So don't do that. Um, that's why you use two in case one of the squibs or one of the, one of the um, firing lines has been compromised. Um, or one of the nails doesn't work, or any number of different things, it's, it's a fail-safe. So use two. Um, so that's how you would do it professionally. You can rent these things. They're, Matt Sweeney rents them from L in LA. A bunch of other people make them. Um, you can't really get them anywhere else except a, a props, a special effects shop, because they don't really have any other use. You can, if you were being more dangerous, use a small piece of debt cord, which is we talked about in the pyrotechnics um, class, is uh, what looks like a piece of um, coax cable, but it's got dynamite in it. Um, dynamite, something like that, um, that, act, that it is um, triggered by shock and is very explosive and very, very fast. It's like a fuse. So you could wrap this um, in debt cord or even just a small piece in the corner. You fire it electronically with a, with a detonator, with a squib. Um, the only downside to that is it's explosives. Um, so you will actually see an explosion. Um, and if anybody's nearby, they're probably going to get peppered with shrapnel in the form of small chunks of glass. So don't do that unless you're in the middle of a big field and you don't mind picking up all those little bits of glass. Anyway, stuntman can retire. So we're not going to do that because we don't have an ATF license because I have all my fingers, my eyes, my ears. What we are going to do is look at other ways of doing this. And well, let's start with the, let's start with the most basic way. You may have seen one of these if you own a vehicle if you don't own a vehicle this is a small escape hammer um, they sell them in auto parts stores and places like that the idea is you drive your car off the off the bridge um, you're in Chappaquiddick or somewhere um, you drive a car off the bridge into the river um, and the battery the windows don't go down and you need to break your way out you use this pointy bit which has got a metal slug, so it's got some heft behind it, to break the window, um, the side window, not the front window, because that's laminated glass. Back window will also work. And this bit here is to cut the seat belt. Um, how well that works, I don't really know, but I know for a fact this cost me one dollar, um, and it doesn't work because it's not hardened. You can eventually break this piece of glass by wailing on it. I mean, I mean really wailing on it. Um, and it will dent this. The end of this will flatten over because it's not hardened, because it's a piece of junk. So if you do buy one of these, you ideally want to get one with a piece of something quite hard on the end. And um, by quite hard, I mean a piece of tungsten, um, like a drill bit, um, harder than a drill bit, uh, a masonry bit. Something very, 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 very hard. Um, and we'll go into, well, I'm gonna read you a little bit because, so, on the hardness scale, glass 
it's pretty hard. Glass is about 5.5 on the Mohs scale, named after somebody called Mohs a long time ago, um, where one is talcum powder and 10 is diamond. So somewhere in the middle of that is glass. So where were we? Oh right, the Mohs scale. So tungsten would be an eight. Tungsten carbide I think is nine and a half, something like that. And my personal favorite, alumina. Not aluminium or aluminium, but alumina, which is sintered, that means powdered and squished together. Um, alumina, whatever that is. But what it is, is available in the form of the insulation on spark plugs. This is, I think, it says, what does it say here? Yeah, 9.9, .9, something like that. So it'll scratch glass, it'll break glass. It's much harder than pretty much anything. Uh, you've probably seen YouTube videos, and I think there is one on my canvas resource, um, showing somebody tossing lightly a piece of this. I broke this with a hammer because it is very hard, but it is brittle. Um, a piece of this, if I threw this at that, piece of glass here, it's a good chance it would break. So I'm not going to go and do that. We're going to do that in a slightly more controlled environment where my eyeballs aren't so close to that glass. So it's all about hardness. You need something harder than glass. Much as people say that you can test whether a diamond is real by will it scratch glass. All that means is it's harder than 5.5 on the Mohs scale, where diamond is 10, one is talc, and glass is 5.5 somewhere in the middle. So not really a very good test. There's plenty of cubic zirconia which will scratch glass and are fake as all fakeness. So um, how are we going to use that to advantage, our advantage? We, so we can use something like this, which is meant to be hard but isn't because it's junk, but a better one would be. You can buy a Leatherman type multi-tool which has a tiny piece of, I think it might be tungsten or carbide, on the end of it designed for breaking glass. Um, you can get, you can use one of these. This is a spring-loaded center punch, one of my favorite tools and should be one of yours. Um, I've showed this to you before. It's for making dents in things. Um, if you wanted to drill a hole in something, um, to stop the drill bit skating around, you could just do that and it will leave a dent. Uh, and then the drill will stay where it is. These are also extremely hard. The only disadvantage of using one of these is, even though they're very hard, if I spring load punch into this, there's a very good chance I'm gonna dent the end of my, this is probably a $35 tool. This, however, came from Harbor Freight, and I believe it cost me $1.98 without tax. Sometimes they give them away if you buy something worth more than five bucks. Worth having a few of these. Um, this is junk, this is lovely. But having said that, I've owned this for mm, 15 years and I've made a lot of small dents in things with it. So you can use one of these. Um, worth noting that as we, saw, as we saw earlier, the stress is all in the corners. Not all of it, but it's in the corners and the edges. So if I wanted to use a hammer, for example, to break this piece of glass, I would tap it hard in the corner and it would break. If I smack it here, we'll do that later, don't worry, I'll smack it pretty hard too. Um, it'll be very hard to break. Um, you've probably also seen videos of people using baseball bats trying to break side windows of cars. And the bat often bounces off and hits them in the face to great comic effect. Um, we don't want to do that. Um, so you'll be tapping the glass in the corners. So your glass poppers or your center punch or your rescue tool. So if you do go off the bridge, hit the window in the corner, in the very cornerest corner you can get a hold of. If you hit it in the middle, you could be there all day. Unless you've got a very good one of these. If you have this one, you're probably not going to make it. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, We'll try it all three ways. We'll try it the funnest way first, which is wailing on it with a hammer. Um, this is really not the way anybody is ever going to do this unless they were doing it on camera, showing somebody wailing around with a hammer. Um, but I want to show you how strong glass is, toughened glass is, and how it breaks. Uh, worth noting, this is 
is either quarter inch, I think it's quarter inch glass, which is kind of too thick. Um, the video um, on canvas showing the guy running into the tempered glass and failing, I suspect he failed because in his earlier attempts, they used really thin glass. And then he did it in, did it in China and they went, huh, what's this, big American man? We'll give you glass that's quarter of an inch thick, like this stuff. Okay, so we're back. A little bit of safety equipment because this is safety glass, but it is not safe. So we're gonna screw these blocks down to the ground so the glass doesn't fly away when I hit it. And by ground, I mean table. Time for a new bit, I think. Okay, so hearing protection because this is going to get quite loud. I'm probably going to have to wail on this glass a bit. And as I say, it is safety glass, tempered glass, but it's still going to make a mess and fly everywhere. So you want to... This is really just to show you how strong tempered glass is and how difficult it is to break. I might break it on the first attempt. We'll find out. As you can see, I am given a, a little bit of a whale. There is an expression in the construction business. Don't force it, get a bigger hammer. I've managed to break the wooden blocks. So, We'll go a little bit more extreme and use this kind of hammer, but the pointy end. And I'll have to make some new blocks. And I'm going to hit it on the edge. Mm. Maybe the corner. Next time we'll do it in slow motion. But you see how difficult it was to break by hitting it in the middle. But one tap in the corner, it pops like that. And we are left with the universal sign that somebody has broken into your car. This. So, welcome back. I've cleaned the shop up, which is always worth remembering. Reset time is a long if you have to sweep up small chunks of glass that have spread everywhere and crunch underfoot, and though they are square, are still quite sharp. But anyway, so we smashed some glass with a hammer. That's fun and easy. But what if we have our stuntman running towards the glass? It's kind of difficult to accurately smack the edge of the glass with a hammer to get that coordinated explosion of glass. So we want to do it a little bit more in a more sophisticated manner. And here's a way I pulled out of my workshop that is basically an electrically operated pea shooter. But instead of a pea, what we're going to fire is a slug of aluminum, which is just about the right size for this piece of PVC tubing. There's a hole drilled in it. In that hole goes a masonry nail. And the reason it's removable is we want to sharpen this because every time we do it, it dents it and flattens the end. So we're going to sharpen this. It has been sharpened. We're going to put it inside this barrel. When you apply electricity to this, this solenoid valve will open rapidly. The air, which is just waiting to get out of this accumulator tank, will rush probably at around 30 or 40 psi and blast this little guy donk, into there. And that whole process will probably take mm, a quarter of a second. So obviously we'll, you would practice this to get it right. And this isn't a particularly good way of doing it. It's just a way of doing it that I came up with when you don't have access to any squibs. An important, important thing to remember is to use an accumulator tank. That's annoying. 
Um, the reason for that is uh, these quick fit, quick connect fittings that you see everywhere on air hoses, male and female, they go together. Um, there isn't a hole through the middle of these. Not a hole you can see daylight through. When you put them together, the air has to go through a very serpentine and small little hole. It's actually quite hard to blow through one of these. This is the choke point in any, any pneumatic system. So we've taken that out by the fact there's five gallons of compressed air in here and there is nothing stopping the air going through until we get to here. And this is a little bit restrictive, but it'll do for our purposes because we don't need a huge amount of air coming out here to make this little bullet go quite fast. And again, don't try this at home. I'm a barely trained professional and I'm doing this at my own risk. So, we need something to trigger this to apply electricity, not just sticking it into a power strip. So we're going to use um, a switch I use for other things, not for triggering, really, but this will do the trick. It's basically just a light switch with a protector so that I can drop it without it triggering and it says off and on and again don't do this at home so we're going to plug the whole thing together we're going to put air in here we're going to put a we'll call it a bullet we'll put it we'll call it a slug we'll put our slug in here we're going to put a bit of paper around paper towel around it for wadding so we get a nice fast firing speed we're going to clamp this down because every action has an equal and opposite reaction like that so we're going to clamp this down and aim right in the corner and then with a bit of luck I'll be able to throw our stuntman at the glass and at the same time press the button. It's not going to work, is it? But that's the idea and I'll be able to do it remotely from the other side of the room where it's much, much safer rather than standing next to it and getting glass in my shirt. So I'm going to wriggle this up. There's no point in you watching because it's kind of boring. That was five. More like 20. Okay, so we have screwed the pea shooter down to the table. It can't move and lose any of our potential energy here and let's look at what we're doing so the air is coming in filling this accumulator I will then turn it off when it gets to about 30 pounds so we, I know we'll have 30 pounds in this tank and not the 120 pounds that's coming into this line so we'll turn that off then the air was, is waiting in this tube coming to this solenoid valve which is connected to the switch when I turn the switch there's no in there and no air in there right now but you'll hear the click that's the solenoid valve opening. When I do that, the air, the 30 pounds of air, backed up by this accumulator tank, will push our slug, which I haven't put in yet, into the glass. Right now, we've made this so that the glass slides out of the way so I can load it properly. Um, okay, first of all, we're gonna need some tissue paper. So let's talk about wadding. It's not just something you do with smokeless tobacco that you put into your chore chore whatever you do with it it's something to take up extra space so this pvc tube and this piece of aluminum both came off the shelf and they don't quite match up they're pretty close but we want to get rid of that gap so what we're going to do is just simply wrap a piece of paper towel around it and get it in there nice and tight now we're going to ram it Voila, it is now loaded. The glass is now in the way. But before I energize anything else, I'm going to put some safety gear on. Important thing to note, doing anything like this that involves dynamic events, always assume the thing is going to happen at any time. So when I fill this with air, I'm assuming that at some point I might lean on that switch. It might pick up some... I don't know, spare electricity and operate this switch and smash that glass. So the moment is there any possibility of anything happening, I will be doing this and wearing earplugs.
Well, he didn't go through, but that might be to do with the fact he's made of plastic. So, that was another 20 minutes of picking up small pieces of glass wearing gloves, during which time I still managed to cut myself twice. So do not do this unless you really do know what you're doing and you have no other options. If you can buy breakaway glass in big plates and you can afford to do that, do this rather than use tempered glass. Um, and if somebody runs through this, they need to be a stuntman. If you, your face hits this glass as it breaks, you're probably going to get cut. So, that's two ways of breaking glass. We've got a couple more to do. I think I'm just going to break one more piece of glass because I'm getting very tired of sweeping it up. And it's still all over my floor. This is something not to take lightly. So I think we're going to look at the spark plug variety way of breaking glass. And we're going to not quite do it though, just through a piece of glass because timing, it's all about timing. We'll make a little spring-loaded doohickey and we'll hot glue a piece of spark plug and see if we can make that a remote controlled operation, maybe on the end of a string. So with the magic of hot glue, we're gonna do some rapid prototyping. And again, the key word here is rapid. It doesn't have to look nice. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to tell us whether it'll work. Um, we don't wanna waste any extra time making some fancy machined part with bearings and what have you, because it may not work and we'll have wasted all that time. Never go down a road that you can't get back out of quickly in this kind of game. So. We're going to start with hot gluing a piece of alumina to the end of the chopstick. Obviously any stick will work. I just happen to have these and they work very well. And again, now we have to wait for the hot glue. Who has time for that? So we want to make some kind of bearing and the bearing is going to be about there, I think. Well, maybe there, something like that, something there maybe. And we're going to have a washer on top of it and then another washer. So we'll do that first. Again. There we have a bearing. It's very, very crude, just the way I like it. And if we do this, we can see that it's going to make contact and we can hot glue the alumina to the washer. Again, the whole thing is loose, so if the hot glue gets in there, it doesn't really matter. Again, we're just trying to get a proof of concept. Does it work? Is it worth investing any more time in doing this? And there we have, kind of, Maybe a little tightener. There. So that wasn't too bad. And because we're really cheap, I'm going to put a slip knot on the end of here. There. Now when I pull this, whammo, this goes into there at some rate of speed. Obviously I could probably shorten this so I'd get a faster lever action, but that's the way we're going to do it. So let's go to the slow-mo. Nope. Utter, utter failure, but you can see if I get the light right, it actually made some dents out of focus. It made some dents in the glass, which leads me to suspect this may not be tempered glass, or it's not very tempered. Remember, I got these for free. They were test pieces, so maybe they were testing something else. We'll break this piece anyway to find out, but I'm gonna try it on a slightly, so this is also a quarter of an inch thick. Window glass on a car is never a quarter of an inch thick, unless you're buying a very nice Mercedes. Um, so we'll try it on a slightly thinner piece. This is 3 sixteenths. Um, and we'll do the same thing and see if we can make it pop. Utter failure. Let's try the Harbour Freight centre punch in the corner. We are not having a good day today, are we? 
This is actually an object lesson in make sure the glass you have really is tempered glass. Um, as I say, these were, I did not pay for these. So that might be a lesson in that. I'm going to hit it with a hammer and we're just going to see if it breaks, if it breaks at all. And if it does, what it looks like when it does. Let me get a hammer. So it did break, but not very satisfactorily. I think probably the main problem was the thickness of this glass. It is, as you can see, quite thick. And where yeah, focus is all to hell. Um, it's also, I believe, there are different levels of tempering. Um, if you were going to do this as a stunt, you would have the glass made, and you would specify that you want it to be very, very, very brittle, very high tension glass. Okay, so what are the takeaways from uh, this breaking glass business? One, breaking glass is dangerous. Glass is sharp, even if it's safety glass. If you're going to do it, you need to use a stuntman or people need to be a long way away from any, any possibility of getting glass on them. Um, even using breakaway glass, you should use a stuntman. Two, it's not as easy as Elon Musk makes it look. Um, YouTube videos of people breaking glass by throwing tiny specks of spark, broken spark plug at them. All the times it didn't work, you didn't see those. The corollary to that is use thin glass, window glass in cars, as I mentioned, it's very thin and often it's curved and under even more tension, so it's easier to break. Three, clean up is a pain in the butt. Uh, there is still glass all over my shop. There will be for some time. Um, uh, it takes a long time to clean up, therefore it takes a lot of money and reset time. You don't want somebody walking across a carpet and you hear crunching because you haven't got all the broken glass up out of the carpet for the next take. So it costs money and time. Uh, and takeaway number five is there is a quiz. So watch the videos in Canvas on the module on breaking glass and take the quiz. Okay, so we'll call that a done. Next, your personal projects. I'm going to talk to you individually um, shortly on a one-to-one -one video chat, but basically, as you, I'm sure you understand, you're going to be doing this theoretically in the, the most part. Um, if, if you have the resources to carry on with your project, please do so. But uh, I suspect for most of you, you're going to have to do this theoretically. So I want an analysis, um, sketches, research video clips, links showing costs where you got where you would get things from, timeline, the, the what, the why, the how, the where, all of that stuff. The idea is so that somebody who is not skilled in the art, as they say, would be able to complete your project using the information that you gave them. And obviously I want to see all that, so submit it all to me. By the way, we've got Six weeks, that will be five weeks from now. Thirdly, thirdly, C, the group project. Uh, as a reminder, I'm gonna finish off making a Venturi blower. Air goes in here, comes out just like a Dyson fan, but $600 cheaper. Um, tiny little holes all the way around here, blow out, and a large, soft waft of air goes that away. Uh, the advantage of a Venturi is, one, it's very quiet, you can turn it off and on just by putting a valve here. Um, and you can throw things in here, leaves, dust, whatever, and they won't get chopped up by the blades. So, but what this needs to make it into a proper Venturi is some kind of cover, some kind of cone-shaped, possibly this long. And uh, so I'd like a suggestion on what and how that might be. I have a reasonably full shop. Um, I'm not going to give you any suggestions about what it could be because I would like you to suggest them. We're going to make two of these. I'm going to make two of these with your assistance. One like this, one that's going to look like this, but is much more like this kind of size. 
And the idea for this is to do for a more tabletop um, close-up stuff where you maybe you have some smoke and you want the smoke to go a certain way. You could actually induce a, an air current towards this. So we're going to start off with this lovely can of chunky tomato bisque, tomato bisque if you like. Um, so what are the, what's the next thing I'm going to do? I'm going to cover this. Suggestions please for materials and methods. It could be just a simple suggestion. We don't, I'm not looking for major anal analysis because I'm going to pick one or two of them and, and do that. Uh, same thing, I'm going to make a miniature version of this and apply it to this. So what's the next step for me to do that process? And I will follow your instruction, no matter how crazy it seems. So that's about all. Uh, I, hope, I hope this is working for you. I hope it's working for me. Um, then we obviously, there are going to be technical issues um, talking to you all and I, any suggestions, questions, let me know. Thank you and good night.